Hey everyone, Brian Beeler and Kevin O'Brien coming to you from the Storage Review Lab. And today we're taking a look at yet another Lenovo server. This is the Think System SR665. Now, as you can tell just from taking a look, it's a standard size 2U server. And this one's just a little bit different than the rest of their line because it's got AMD Epic Gen 2 inside. So as we take a look at this platform, uh, it's got uh, our configuration is we've got SATA SAS in the front, which is even a little hard to say, honestly, in these first couple days. People still use hard drives. They they do. Well, at least this one's an SSD. Would you boot drive for this fellow? What else yes. do we have in here? Well, actually, no. That's not. Uh, those are just accessory drives. Our boot drive is internal. Ooh, yeah. Use the M.2 and then some hard. Oh, gosh. They make me feel a little sick to even touch them. So that's the first couple bays. And in this config, in the middle bays, these are at least NVMe, right? Yes. And when in our testing, you'll see a couple different sets of drives here. We worked with the Micron, uh, what are these, the 9300 and the SK Hynix. Now, these are the Whamma Jamma uh, PCIe Gen 4 drives. So these are really pretty special uh, four terabyte class drives. And then if you need even more storage in the front, this little dude pops out and you can drop in another um, uh, backplane and, and have eight more drives in there. And we've actually done that to a server that we've had in our lab. We had, I think it was the SR850, that uh, we uh, self-added a um, uh, eight bay, any bay uh, section into for NVMe. And we also did that on the uh, One U box where we swapped out the entire front plane for Gen 4. Yeah, it's very easy. But it's very easy. And then as we see, as we'll go through here, anything with a blue tab on it is pretty much like pull and Pull and play, plug and play, pull and I remove. I think it's a end user probably won't destroy the system if they're doing it themselves. All right. Anyway, it makes it really easy to swap out just about anything in this box. So, like I said, we've got SATASAS here, we've got PCIe here, including Gen 4 support, and then we've got blank ones down here. But Lenovo's got, I would say, a dozen, but there's probably more ways to configure this server. As we kind of go back, we see the, uh, the cabling that runs back. Of course, they're hot swappable fans. And actually, Here's a really interesting thing, is if you pull up on those blue tabs, like I was talking about, the whole unit just lifts out. So to Kevin's point, most people aren't going to be climbing in here and replacing the entire fan block, but how easy was that? That's four seconds of effort. Plus, it's got this little joystick here, which there's no LCD. Is this for Pac-Man? No, that is to tell you if your case has been opened while you haven't been around it. I so much would rather be playing Pac-Man than worrying about case manipulation. Uh, but when we pull that up, that actually reveals the some of your favorite parts. Let's talk uh, about what's on top here on the shroud, and then we'll pull that off. So on here we have our battery backup for the uh, onboard RAID card. That is if you're still using normal Wait, flash or hard Maybe drives. it's for an RC car, and this is your joystick to control it. Sadly not. There are still hard drives involved. Uh, and then we have our uh, dual M.2 uh, boot drive sled, and this is helpful if you don't want to use more expensive real estate for uh, your boot drive, and you still want to keep it protected. And I believe you can configure this guy in either RAID 1 or JBOD, depending on if you want uh, okay. some parity there. And but, if you don't want this stuff, and we'll get to it in a second when we roll through the slides, but there's a whole mid-plane storage option that we'll, we'll get into. So we pull that, and that reveals the two AMD EPIC uh, CPUs inside, all the RAM slots with the blanks in for spacing and airflow, and those glorious radiators. I know you want to talk about the radiator. Yeah, so on most of the uh, servers, uh, for a low profile uh, platform, you're gonna have a, a fairly broad um, CPU heatsink, but you're gonna end up losing uh, RAM slots or just it's gonna take up a huge amount of space. And on most two, you usually end up with the taller um, uh, heat sink but, right that are almost as tall as the case your yeah. standard tall boy yeah and that eat, uh, eats up space for if you want to use anything on, uh, above there so in, in most servers you don't generally put things in the mid plane but on Lenovo they offer some options that fit in this space so to handle the uh, higher TDP uh, CPUs is gigantic uh, uh, radiators on front which um, might actually have more combined surface area than most heat sinks and you get, uh, it's able to shed off a lot of heat and it puts it right behind the fan instead of worrying about like carryover airflow. Plus, if you ever get really hard up, you can yank out those copper pipes and go down to the uh, recycling place. It might not cover the cost of the uh, server, but there might be some sense in there for you. All right, and then as we go to the back, we've got power supplies in the rear corner. 
and then a riser that's not installed on this unit and a riser by you that is installed. Now this is um, a lot of the platforms, and this isn't just Lenovo but others, uh, you can buy specific risers for um, if you want a lot of uh, by 16, some by 8 sl uh, slots. It really depends on how you uh, end up deploying the server. Yeah, so in our case we want mostly connectivity, so uh, what you have in here, fiber? Yeah, we used a, um, we had a um, two port uh, 32 gig fiber channel card and for that it's just a uh, by eight uh, electrical slot but if you're doing GPUs or something else you may want a different configuration yeah of course okay uh, so we talked a lot about configuration that covers most of the hardware let's actually dive into the uh, uh, the deck here a little bit because we've got some more highlights on the configuration uh, starting with the high level specs 665 like I said to you uh, two AMD Epic Gen 2 CPUs, plenty of uh, room for DRAM up to four terabytes in the box, the slots Kevin was talking about. Um, overall, this is pretty garden variety stuff. Uh, let's go to the next, because that's where it really gets interesting, I think. Now, we talked about configuration options. They've got basically on the front these chunks of bays that can be configured almost any which way you can. Yeah, there's pretty much if you want any amount of flavor of um, two and a half inch NVMe or three and a half inch, although it doesn't look like you can combine three and a half inch with NVMe. It's um, insanity. Who would do such a thing? Well, I mean, if you want capacity, although these days you probably can get higher capacity on just NVMe drives than you can the top end. Raw hard capacity, drives. but not capacity per dollar. No. But even so, there's a bunch of choices. And actually, you probably can. You could do three and a half inch on the internal bays or on the front with NVMe on the mid plane. Yeah. Uh, and actually, let's take a look at that too, because this thing is one of my favorite storage inventions. Yeah, so this is where those radiators come into play. There's a lot of space that's generally underutilized on in the middle of the server, and Lenovo's able to take use of that. Yeah, so these guys camp out in a 80s style uh, action movie where the, the rocket launcher lifts up and, and shoots its things out, except for the drives don't shoot out, thankfully. Uh, but yeah, like on the bottom one where you've got eight bays plus the M.2, that's pretty sweet, and just the density of those things camping out on top of the CPUs is pretty darn slick. That is not all, though, because we could put more storage on the back. Yeah, so it really comes down to, uh, do you want a lot of high performance, do you want boot drives, do you want uh, high capacity, or do you want, like, everything? Which is kind of fun when you get into servers that it doesn't really matter what you want. If you want everything, Lenovo can do that. Well, that's the great thing about it, too, because these servers underpin so many of their software-defined or hyper-converged offerings from Nutanix or vSAN or Pivot3 or whoever else they're working with these days. You know, days. a lot of vendors like to do uh, different tiering. Mm -hmm. So you might have a mixture of um, read-write flash, heavy read flash, a moderate, uh, moderate oh, I don't want to say performance, but a moderate uh, high-capacity uh, spinning media and then maybe a archive spinning media but I mean you could do everything in the all box of it all the or same QLC time. SSDs or with Optane I mean Intel's doing some great job or is doing some great work doing a great job and even though this is an AMD box it still obviously works fine with any SSDs even if they're from Intel so let's go take a look at performance because we did a couple different things using again like I said the eight micron drives and also you did some work with the gen 4 Hynix drives yeah, so a lot of the, uh, this is kind of funny when it comes to the AMD platforms specifically, a lot of these were positioned as uh, more value offerings uh, at the onset, and um, it turned into their, in certain areas, the higher performance or highest performance options right now that you can buy. And in our SQL server test, it really, we've been maxing that out. And this is with, uh, we used to kind of find a more of a sweet spot at four and eight VMs, and eight VMs used to kind of, be a little more stressful for some of these platforms, but now it's like it doesn't matter. It just it flatlines the test. Yeah, so it's quick. Yes, and that shows in our Sysbench test where we're seeing upwards of thirty-three thousand transactions per second at sixteen VMs on one box, yeah. which is just insane. Yeah, that's impressive. Considering you know you talked about coming out as a value play initially, and that's sort of what it was. I think well. AMD was finding out where they could get a foothold in the in the server market since they've been gone for so long. 
But at that uh, Epic Gen 2 launch, AMD was out there talking about their 130 world records, and maybe it was 100 then, and now it's 130, whatever it is, it's a boatload of records. And there's no doubt, because when you look at a platform like this, and you look at the core count of what's available in those 7742s, and the compute or the uh, storage power you can put in the front with Gen 4, it's amazing what these and boxes can do. It does bring up an important point on licenses, because a lot of these boxes uh, that were initially launched oh, yeah. as... I forgot. This is a, a four-box, box, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, as value offerings because uh, get as much done, uh, get as much work done on one CPU as you could on two Intel. Um, a lot of the, uh, ser- no, a lot of the uh, software guys are like, okay, well, technically it's one socket, but it performs like two. We're going to start licensing as two. So from a licensing pr- uh, perspective with uh, E6i7, for example, this is a quad CPU system because it's over 32 uh, the cores, cores per a CPU. Yes. So as you drill to the core, you get to the point where you're paying for multiple CPU licenses for uh, for this box specifically. But you could uh, down spec it a little bit with more virtualization compliant CPUs if you so choose. But if you want the best the box can be, then you will pay for it if you're going to be in the VMware virtualized world. However, there are alternatives. Yeah, and some might, some people might ask why you uh, might why you want to go with a uh, dual proc system with a lower spec uh, core count CPU. There are more options that you can generally find on a, uh, a dual socket system. You're going to have more PCI lanes, so if you want to have more um, NVMe storage, for example, without uh, PCI switches, you want to go with a dual uh, CPU box. Or if you want additional spaces for add-on cards or GPUs, sure. There are areas where it makes sense to go for a dual proc system, even though you're kind of going with a low end uh, or lower end CPU. Sure. All right, let's go back to the performance here and see what what else we've got. Now, this is where it gets kind of fun because you've dropped in the uh, Gen 4 drives from Hynix. Yeah, and this isn't really showing one is better than the other besides the, one is better know, than the other, well, though. It's, it's more showing the generational improvement that you're going to find going to a uh, Gen 4 enabled right, drive. Sophia. So huge pr- improvement on latency and uh, bandwidth. In this case, uh, we maxed out, I think it was like 32 or 32, uh, 33 gigabytes per second on eight drives. And again, I mean, you could stuff a lot more in this. Okay. Uh, on sequential write, again, a huge improvement uh, on the uh, Gen 4 Hynix drives. In this area, we uh, topped around 13 gigabytes a second, which again, it's, it's pretty good. But that's just on eight drives. Yes. And then uh, random read, uh, the Gen 3 drive that we had kind of eked it out a little on the high end, but it really comes down to the benchmark that you're running or the uh, the number of drives, the type of drive, because a lot of these guys, it's not it's not like the company just says one, uh, sells one drive in that product line. You're going to have SKUs based on drive rights per day, capacities, and things like that. So it really depends on the drive itself. So overall, have we... We've seen so many servers that sometimes I lose track, but to me this feels like, and the other one too, the 635, feels like some of, if not the most flexible servers out there in terms of configuration of drives and CPUs and whatever else. Yeah, Lenovo's done a fantastic job on how to position their servers. It really shows the the, the engineering levels, and it's not just the, it can do everything, but if you need to change it in the field, you can do that. I mean, we've done that. Which we've done a couple times, as Kevin noted, with backplanes, right? Yeah. It's really easy. Like I said, if you know, I'm basically a monkey with the hardware, and if you can just find the blue tabs and pull, the things are going to come out. That's not always a good sign, but it does make it really easy to modify the platform if you have to, understanding that most people won't ever need to do that, but you can, and that's the way they've engineered it. If we wanted to drop in that midplane, we could pull this off, get the midplane piece, put it in, cable it, and be ready to go in probably, I don't know, eight, 10 minutes. I mean, it's, it's really quick. So overall, really flexible system. As we said, underpinning all of their software-defined offerings, their converged uh, hardware offerings. So that's an important component of helping Lenovo offer flexible solutions there too. Like I said, Nutanix, vSAN come to mind, but there are many others that they're involved in. And, um, you know, Build quality, reliability, everything else is, is there, right? Yeah. So thanks for checking out the review. Definitely do yourself a favor. And if you're looking at uh, AMD Epic Gen 2 systems, check out Lenovo. Uh, this one or the One U uh, counterpart, uh, really great systems. Thanks for tuning into the review.